The Royal Geographical Society holds one of the greatest collections of geographical knowledge in the world. A grant of £5 million from Britain's Heritage Lottery Fund has enabled the Society to expand their collections and make them available to all of the globe via the internet. Among more than half a million artefacts pre-1920 is an atlas from 1482 revealing the extent of geographical knowledge at the time. From photos of Arabia almost a century ago to Nepal in the mid-19th century, the range is vast. A famous British explorer in Africa was Dr. David Livingstone, an honoured member of the Society. Livingstone's slave chains were used as part of his campaign against slavery. He was vociferous and better known perhaps for his explorations of the Nile, but he was also a great anti-slavery campaigner. He used the chains in a lecture to the Society and other lectures in London in the 1860s. The project to put over two million items online began six years ago. It should prove an ideal research tool for students and teachers worldwide. The new study centre is at the heart of a new era for the Society. The heritage that has given the Royal Geographical Society preeminence has not been thrown away. Instead, its precious treasures can now be appreciated by a truly global audience. The courtyard of the Victoria and Albert Museum has been transformed with the installation of 10 garden sheds. Each offered as a blank canvas for leading artists to create their own individual works, stimulating the eyes and ears in a sensory feast. Dubbed the Other Flower Show, the exhibition was timed to coincide with the traditional Chelsea Flower Show to give visitors a very different and unique take on a garden theme. Like all art, the shed installations require time and thought for the viewer to appreciate the creator's intention. A theme explored by German artist Andreas Ollert invites the visitor to take a second look. He says he wanted something very playful, very colourful, something which you would see only on the second view. Another shed encourages visitors to participate in creating the art itself and uses crayons to complete the design. The sheds were on show for a few weeks before being auctioned off to the highest bidders proceeds used to help pay for the Victoria and Albert Museum's garden project. The so-called lost personal papers of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, went on sale at Christie's in London. The papers, which include handwritten manuscripts and sketches, were found in the vaults of a London law firm. The whereabouts of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's personal papers was a real-life mystery for over half a century. When they were uncovered at a central London law firm, the collection of 3,000 letters, drawings and personal effects revealed details of the great writer's life which were not previously known. Born in Scotland in 1859, Arthur Conan Doyle grew up to become one of society's great intellects. As well as his writing, his interests included motoring, golf, politics and spiritualism. Each of these and other interests are represented in the items that were up for auction. The collection, the lost papers of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, are said to be worth over two million pounds. Mongolia's embattled herders are bearing the brunt of a winter disaster. 
100,000 head of livestock died of starvation when extreme cold hit Mongolia, while snow blanketed land on which animals would graze in normal winters. Officials feared that up to 2.5 million animals could die, a grim prospect for nomadic herders who rely on them for food, heating, transport and cash. The immediate consequences are severe. Most herders are migrating with their enfeebled animals in a desperate search for better pastures, while those who have lost their herds are forced to move to the cities to join the ranks of the jobless. It's a hopeless situation for many, and concerns grow about the impact of the disaster on the nation's younger generation. Freezing temperatures have left thousands of children sickened with colds and fever. These days, tents do not have sufficient heating because families without herds have no access to animal dung, the traditional heating material. Families have little to eat, with many children surviving on a simple diet of wheat flour products. Even milk and dairy products have become a rare sight for those that have lost their animals. The disasters are also having devastating psychological effects. Buyan Tok To, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, faces a bleak future after her family lost all their livestock. Without formal education, children will have none of the skills needed to find a regular job in one of the towns. Those who have lost their animals during a winter disaster cannot learn how to manage livestock. Dalai used to be a herder, but he and his family moved to the county centre after all their animals died. He has no job and no money to afford schooling for his children and fears for their future. The long-term social effects will be crippling to a poor country like Mongolia, where herders form about one-third of the country's 2.4 million population. The International Red Cross has said nearly 700,000 people have been severely affected by harsh weather and have launched an appeal for emergency aid. Mongolia has lost a third of all its livestock, more than 11.2 million cattle, horses, camels, yaks, sheep and goats. They're lost, but they love it. Visitors at the Mirror Maze in Longleat, Wiltshire work their way through the 1,000 square metres of mirrors, flashing lights and audio effects. Half a million people of all ages come to Longleat each year. Among other attractions, they laugh and scream as they struggle to find the way out of the King Arthur Maze. One of them, Adrian Fisher, is the designer of the maze. Still, he seems to enjoy the infinity effect created by the mirrors. It's a game for him but it's also a lifetime occupation. Meet Adrian Fisher, founder and owner of Adrian Fisher Mazes. Over 25 years ago, he had a dream, a hobby, a box of drawing colors and of paper. Today, his company with its 12 employees has a track record of producing more than 400 mazes all over the world. On a lawn outside the Fisher's home, workers are putting together the pieces of a portable maze. This is designed and marketed to individual consumers for parties and entertainment events. Other products include inflatable mazes, playing cards and puzzles. At a studio adjacent to the main building, designers sit at their computers planning more and more places where people can get lost. Before they joined the maze industry, they worked as illustrators, graphic or website designers. And they used their creativity and various computer softwares to plan. Fifty-two-year-old Fisher and his team are responsible for mazes in up to 25 countries around the world. Among them a castle-shaped maze in the United States, a dragon maze in the United Kingdom, and a jasmine maze which has just been planted and is scheduled to open ahead of the Olympics in 2008. Fisher claims to be the only full-time maze-making operation in the world. 
And it seems like his family business might expand to the next generation. As Fisher and his six-year-old son Wilfred go throughout the hedge maze in Longleat, it is not clear who is leading who. Only six, Wilfred knows he should be looking for the middle or find a bridge to climb on to make his way out safely. But no, he still doesn't know whether he wants to be a maze maker when he grows up. In a mirror maze in Hamburg, young and old experience the newly opened Hamburg Dungeon. This mirror maze, made by Fisher's company, is designed both to entertain and teach with a display of medieval figures and themes. And although facing a scary challenge, visitors are having fun and confident that they will manage to find their way out. Once famed as the classical Apsara or angel dancers around the ancient temples of Angkor Wat, the fairer sex in this impoverished, war-torn Southeast Asian country is taking on a meaner appearance. Female kickboxers who are regulars in provincial boxing bouts are flexing their muscles in the capital Phnom Penh and on screen to the resounding approval of enthusiasts. Fights held at a specially built ring in the headquarters of a Phnom Penh television station draw in hundreds of supporters to cheer on the rising stars of the female boxing circuit. The violent sport, in which knees, elbows and feet can be used as well as fists, is widely popular in Cambodia, where it has made a strong resurgence since the 1970s and with the demise of Pol Pot's ultra-moused Khmer Rouge. After burning incense to pay respects to the local spirits and bowing to their coaches, the two girls then fly at each other, spurred on by the cries of the crowd and raucous beats of traditional musical instruments. Internationally, the style of kickboxing practiced in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Thailand is known universally by the Thai language name Mutai. Although identical to kickboxing in neighboring Thailand, Proud Khmers like to claim the ancient sport as their invention, saying that bas reliefs on the walls of the ancient Angkor temples are proof that Cambodians have been practicing the sport for centuries. It is a claim hotly contested by the Thais. The sport was banned by the Khmer Rouge and Cambodians are desperate to preserve what they say is a unique piece of culture to the point of passing it down through family. Drenched in sweat and with their gloved fists flying, Sox Ray Touch and Torn Chan Ray are a world away from the traditional image of the demure and petite Cambodian maiden.
Authorities are happy to see more and more women taking an interest in the ring in the hope that it will keep them from crime or prostitution. This is an exhibition of the paintings of Edward Hopper. Born in 1882 in New York State, Hopper's work from the beginning presented snapshots, usually with an unsettling undercurrent of America. Simple landscapes and city scenes were presented with the aim of creating the maximum effect with the minimum imagery. Nighthawks from 1942 is a classic example of Hopper's world, resembling the setting for a film thriller. The sparse detail shows a quirky humour, such as highlighting the name of a laxative in an important early work, Drugstore. Fascinated by light, especially sunlight, he explored its effect through the decades. Sunlight wasn't necessarily a bringer of happiness. There could be a sinister edge underneath. And his buildings, often deserted or with a solitary inhabitant, had an effect on a filmmaker such as Alfred Hitchcock from the 1940s onwards. Over more than half a century, Edward Hopper explored light and a world of often solitary figures. The female model was always his wife Jo, and the couple are together as clowns in his last painting. Kinichi Hori just can't get enough of the sea. After circumnavigating the world once before, this Japanese adventurer is ready to do it again, this time in the opposite direction. Hori shot to fame back home when in his early 20s he became the first Japanese person to sail across the Pacific Ocean solo. He then went on to sail around the world solo and non-stop westward. Now he's prepared to set sail eastward and south through the treacherous Magellan Straits off the southern coast of Chile. This trip is meant in part to honour the first man to do the same feat. Ferdinand Magellan was the first sailor to circumnavigate the globe. The full trip non-stop is expected to last eight months and he will communicate with home base back in Japan via a satellite internet connection. His fight against the elements is the message he hopes to bring home. Hori is something of a national hero. Some have called him Japan's oceanic Charles Lindbergh. And he was given a hearty farewell as he set sail from his hometown of Kobe in western Japan. Hori, known for his environmental work, has also travelled the seas in a yacht of recycled beer cans. This time, however, he navigates in a more orthodox 13 metre long vessel called the Mermaid. Hori says he hopes this time his adventure will show off how beautiful it is to challenge the oceans once more.
A thousand women wearing kimonos gathered at the Kapakuza Theatre in Tokyo to watch a special dance performance and see an exhibit of old kabuki costumes to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the art. The brightly coloured silk costumes, some nearly a hundred years old, were displayed in the lobby of the theatre which is dedicated solely to kabuki or traditional Japanese theatre. The costumes are owned by the Japanese department store Mitsukoshi, which started as a kimono specialty shop centuries ago before turning into a department store. They were commissioned kabuki costumes by the actors as well as the theater and have collections that date back to a century ago. The event was organized by Mitsukoshi as part of a drive to review its past and also provide a place for people to wear kimonos, which are rarely worn these days. The kimono-clad visitors looked at the intricate embroidery and brocade of the costumes as they waited for a special dance performance by kabuki actor Tokizo Nakamura. Nakamura is one of Japan's leading omnigata or kabuki actors who specialize in women's roles. As he twirled around the stage in the ornate costume of Fuji Musume or Wisteria Maiden, the audience watched enraptured. Nakamura wears kimonos daily, but he said he spends much of his private time wearing Western clothes, which are more practical for life in modern Japan. This exhibition aboard HMS Belfast in London is an exploration of the machinery used by Allied troops on the beaches of Normandy. On the 6th of June 1944, 200,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy with an extraordinary arsenal of machinery. It included tanks that could drive through water, machines that could breathe fire, and vehicles which could lift barbed wire. Visiting the exhibition were some of Britain's most respected war veterans, DD Tank Commander Sam Handelar and glider pilot Jeff Barkway. Handelar said, I'm not sure whether young people should know this much about war. It's not a nice thing, to be honest with you. D-Day, Men and Machines, reveals the inventions, inventors, and the fearless soldiers behind the greatest amphibious invasion in world history.